So we would like a world where people feel much more comfortable talking about and thinking about death. Mm -hmm. um, and we're developing our business and our platform and all that kind of stuff and our products um, to try and help facilitate that. Today I'm joined by Dominic Halton, CEO of Dead Happy, uh, a company built to make the life insurance process less scary and helping to get it done quickly and easily. We've been fascinated with this product since we came across it for Pulse uh, last year and we found it super interesting and potentially provocative in its tone of voice and showing the staid and conventional narratives around death and the finances are not fit for purpose in 2020. So uh, I guess on the face of it, Dead Happy is a, a life insurance business. Yeah. Um, we're doing life insurance quite differently mm -hmm. to everyone else, as you kind of already mentioned. Um, but hopefully in the longer term, we're much more than that as a business. You know, we have this fairly grand ambition of changing people's attitudes to death, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is, a, is a tough thing to do. We think, you know, certainly in Western society, death is just far too taboo. People don't think about it. They don't talk about it. You know, they, they don't plan for it. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that's very unhealthy because mm -hmm. when someone does die, particularly unexpectedly, um, it leaves a whole load of nasty admin for their for their friends and family to deal with, basically, on top of the grieving process. So, so we would like a world where people feel much more comfortable talking about and thinking about death. Mm -hmm. um, and we're developing our business and our platform and all that kind of stuff and our products um, to try and help facilitate that. Who are your competitors, both sort of in a product perspective and maybe for this core message of, you know, trying to make it a little easier to talk about these things? Um, well, in terms of kind of trying to tackle the taboo of death, mm. um, uh, we're certainly not alone. Um, there's lots of, of people that, that recognize the same thing as we do mm -hmm. um, and are trying to change things. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call them competitors. <laughs> I think they're contributors more than anything else. Um, so, so yeah, there's a few, but you know, I don't think anyone yet has broken into the mainstream. Yeah. And you know, death is a is a fairly mainstream thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there is potential, I think, to, to for someone to come along and really take hold of this thing and, mm -hmm. and drive it forward. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of competitors for our product, mm. um, so so we only have one product at the moment, which is life insurance. Um, you know, there's, obviously, there's loads of life insurers out there. Um, I don't think there's anyone that's gone quite as extreme as, as we have. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think typically the product is, is viewed as, as difficult, as complex, um, as something that actually you probably need an advisor to help you with. It's, mm -hmm. it's not something you can do on your own. Um, and I guess we've kind of uh, tried to, to turn that thing completely on its head by completely rethinking the product yeah. um, and making the whole thing much, much simpler and easier. Uh, ultimately, it's a fairly straightforward product. You know, you kind of you pay a bit of money every month, and if, if you die, then your relatives get a big big lump sum, basically. Um, so it shouldn't be that complicated, mm -hmm. um, but it's in the distributor's interest that it, it remains complicated. Yeah. Um, so you know we're basically trying to make it more consumer friendly um, and just make something which is much, much more accessible to, to the everyday person, really. Cool. And um, do you have a specific cohort in mind when you're looking at targeting you know, users, or maybe a psychographic or something like that that you want to tap um, into? Not really. No. Um, you know, when we kind of conceived the, the product, we didn't really have any particular target in mind. Um, I mean, naturally, with, with the way that we're distributing at the moment and the tone of voice we're using and the brand we're using, we are attracting probably a younger audience than most life insurers would, would typically have. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, that wasn't kind of built in from the start. Um, uh, you know, uh, we think our product is relevant for all sorts of different people. I think if you've got really complex financial um, circumstances, probably not, and probably you are better off with a financial advisor. Yeah. But for the rest of us, mm -hmm. which is probably the vast majority, um, you know, something really simple and straightforward kind of kind of works. So, yeah. so we think there's scope for this product being relevant for loads of people. Cool. Um, so a little bit, a little more about you um, and how you sort of arrived here at Dead Happy and what 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 have you sort of moved on, uh, what have you moved through in order to get to this point now you're the chief operating officer and then so how did you sort of like filter yourself into that particular little uh, little hole? Whatever that means. <laughs> um, yeah, we're not big on titles at Dead Happy, <laughs> but you know, we, ha we have to have one. Just get one. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, uh, it hasn't been a, 
uh, a straight path mm -hmm. to, to, I guess, what is predominantly a product role. Mm -hmm. um, but then what, what product person does have one, I guess. Well, yeah. um, so I'm a data analyst by background. Okay. Um, I've been in insurance my whole career, um, uh, working in lots of different functions so I've done you know kind of data analysis roles I've done insight roles I've done product roles I've done strategy roles I've done finance roles I've done all sorts of stuff um, I've worked in like a few different um, kind of corporate startups um, this is the first time that I've ever kind of done it on our own two feet I suppose if you like nice. um, but yeah all with that kind of insurance background although you know never actually properly in life insurance so I'm from a general insurance background maybe kind of car and home insurance. Do you have specific product and design -y teams that were uh, are dead happy and sort of what do they look like for you? Uh, kind of mm. um, I guess we're getting there so um, if you'd have asked me three or four months ago how big the team was I'd have said eight people mm. um, today we're 25 Right. So we've had quite significant growth yeah. in the last few months, um, which is, you know, on the back of a, 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 an investment round um, and, you know, us trying to scale the business beyond kind of where we've been so far. Sure. Um, so, you know, with eight people, you, you have to do quite a lot yourself. Um, and we're transitioning to the point where we've got more people to do more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've got kind of a fledgling product team. Um, so there's kind of two of us who, who work specifically on the product. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a UX person, um, we've got a designer, and then we've got a tech team of probably six, six or seven people, okay. um, supplemented by some, some external resources as well. Right, right, cool. Um, and so the how how would you usually work with that team? So would you sort of like, do you do the pretty much standard sort of two-weeky sprinty type things or is it a bit more looser than that? Or um, up to now, it's been a lot looser than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, as and when. But yeah, we're starting to put those more structured processes in place. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, we've we've had our first few official proper sprints nice. uh, over the last last few months. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're starting to get kind of that, that, that structure to, yeah. to, to how we do stuff. Definitely. Have you found that? So um, I don't know about you, but whenever we, we'll operate a sprint, then it's always a, an extremely retrospective process in the sense of you can very clearly measure your success in terms of like velocity and in terms of um, how you're able to do that sort of, um, how, how your developers are sort of pushing stuff out, what sort of difficulty certain things are. Have you, um, how, how did you find sort of like fitting those things into two week sprinty cycles? Personally, um, well, I mean, you know, firstly, uh, putting some structure in place to to an organisation that didn't have a huge amount mm. um, is is a big a big difference. Um, you know, someone would have an idea one day, and we'd we'd try and get it delivered that that same day, and yeah, or, or within a few days, and, and then go live with it and see what worked and see what didn't. Yeah, um, and I think the spirit of that still exists. Oh, great. Um, but yeah, we just we just need to put a little bit more uh, of a framework around it, really. Right. Um, so I don't know. It's early days. We'll mm. we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, I think over the next few months we're delivering quite a lot of new features. Okay. Um, so we'll kind of see how how all that goes. Um, you know, we've got a lot more capacity now as a business than we've ever had before. So um, whether we can we can cope with that much change so quickly, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we'll see. Hopefully. Yeah. What was the purpose of that sort of tone and why um, why now why now is the right time for that sort of um, well I think I think all of us in in fintech are, are you know very much advocates of plain English mm -hmm. um, you know there are some very very complex products out there financial products yeah. of which life insurance is one um, and you know it just makes sense if you're trying to distribute these directly to consumers that you you strip out that complexity and make it much much easier for people to understand um, so, you know, uh, I'm a massive fan of, of Monzo's tone of voice guidelines. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm sure lots of people are. Um, you know, real great inspiration for, for simplifying stuff down to the, the simplest possible way that you can say stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, not slipping into using a slightly more complicated word when you really don't have to because it's completely unnecessary. Yeah. Um, so that is a, you know, is a, is a good starting point, I think, for, for us. Um, but then, you know, I guess we've tried to layer over it um, something a little bit different. Right. Um, so I think if you take a plain English approach, you can end up with something which is, you know, really, really easy to understand, but in some cases can be a little bit dry. Mm -hmm. um, and in this, you know, topic of death, you know, dryness is, is everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, so we're trying to battle against that, I guess, and, and 
you know, trying to do something very different so that, that people think very differently about the, about the topic. You know, ultimately, we're changing attitudes to death. So if we're going to want people to change their attitudes, we need to behave very, very differently to how everyone else has behaved before. Yeah. So you know, we layer in this element of humor, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of dark humor. You know, it's an uncomfortable topic, death. Yeah. And you know, we're moving away from plain English to more human English, I suppose. The kind of language that people use every day when mm -hmm. talking to their mates kind of thing and their family. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we're taking. Um, not everyone is comfortable with it, for sure. sure. You know, there are some people that feel we go a little bit too far when right. talking in such a blasé way about death. Anyone, um, any in particular instances that you can recall? Um, I mean, nothing specific, I yeah. suppose. You know, it's kind of general comments is, is um, you know, the feedback we've had, it's quite polarizing. Yeah. Um, you know, there are people that absolutely love it and think mm. it's very refreshing and different and about time someone did this kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, makes the whole topic much more palatable for people. And there are people that are just like, that's, that's too much, that's, that's too far. Yeah. Um, and that's fine, you know, we're not for everybody. If, if, if you take that attitude, that's absolutely fine. There's, there's lots of providers that will help you um, who, who will take a much more subtle approach to the topic yeah. um, and, and you're very well served with the rest of the market but for, for everyone else who would actually rather call a spade a spade and, yeah. and you know, have, have, a, have an honest straightforward conversation about the topic um, you know we're there we're there to an, offer an alternative yeah sure okay and um, so the, the building specifically the meat and the meat and the veg behind the whole thing so like um, we, we often talk this and a lot of people will you know be coy on some things and be open about what are the things that you know their sort of systems or technology that they're using how does it work in the back end for you guys you know from that perspective in do terms of tech stack yeah and all, um, yeah, every, all the systems and microservices that go around that do you have uh, specific methods that you're you know employing for those sorts of things um so we launched the product um uh, in php on laravel framework um just simply because that was uh, you know, a really quick and easy way to get something up and running and tested. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we, we launched the product in in a, in a matter of months, yeah. um, which which always amazes our colleagues in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so so that was kind of the, the foundation. Um, we're, um, most of what we do today is still on that platform. Okay. Um, but now, obviously, we're we're growing and, and, and looking to scale the business. We are we are looking to, to move away from that something which is more flexible and scalable. Yeah. Um, so we're going down the route of uh, kind of the, the the JavaScript stack, basically. Okay. Um, and and yeah, microservices and, and, and stuff. We make a huge uh, um, we make huge use of lots of different um, external platforms out there yeah. uh, to kind of plug into our platform just to make stuff quicker and easier and. Mm. Why, why reinvent the wheel? We, we don't need a pay payment system because someone spent a lot of time and effort building that payment system. So, so we plug that in. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots and lots of examples of, of that kind of stuff that we use in our platform just to make things quicker for us and better for the customers, basically. Okay. What sort of um, what sort of like microservice type stuff would you say is essential to running a an insurance type product in this day and age? Would you say? Uh, I guess it depends on, 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 on what approach you're taking. For us, uh, I mean, payments, you know, we have to, we have to collect customers' money. Mm -hmm. um, that's massive. Um, the other one I guess we lean reasonably heavy on is um, Typeform, um, which is like a, a question and answer type, type platform. Yeah. Um, typically used, I guess, for, for surveying customers offline. Yeah. Um, we integrate it into our platform to, yeah, to do online yeah. questioning. Yeah. Um, because with, with life insurance, you know, we've, we've, we've tried to make it as simple as possible and, and reduce the number of questions that we have to ask people down to an absolute minimum. Yeah. But in some cases, we will need additional information. Okay. Um, and you know, we've got a list of 6,000 different medical conditions that, that people can pick from um, when, when talking about their health, basically. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those, we might have one or two follow-up questions off. Okay. Um, and building all of that ourselves into our own platform is going to be a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Typeform does a lot of the heavy lifting for us uh, right. for, for something like that. Nice. Um, and, you know, we've got we've got other, we use Servicate as well, you know, we use other providers of the same kind of thing. Okay. Um, so we're not reliant on, on one provider for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it just speeds things up and, and you know, the experience is good. Um, you know, as I say, uh, people like Typeform and Servicate have spent a lot of time thinking about what the UX of question and answer forms um, looks like. Yeah. Uh, so we don't need to rebuild that. 
okay. and we can just plug into into those. Yeah. Works really well. And um, and how would uh, how would the decisioning element work for 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 you guys in terms of so you've got all this information coming in via your type form and that sort of thing? Um, are you providing the actual insurance as well, or are you outsourcing to different insurance providers? Are you sort of aggregating different providers in one place, or um, and how do you make those decisions? Um, so we're effectively a broker. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with a single insurance provider, okay. um, but um, the product design is ours. Yeah. Um, the, the, all of the, the pricing engine sits on our platform. Yeah. Um, the decision making sits with us, okay. um, uh, with some, some parameters set by, by the insurers, basically. Sure. Um, so, so we do everything. You know, we do all the customer service, all the customer support. We yeah. issue the documentation. Um, you know, we, we basically do everything, cool. um, and, and ultimately the product is underwritten by, by an insurer, Got you. Um, but it's, it's a product of our design, basically. Nice. Cool. All right, so we're going to start off um, by taking a look at the, the, the dashboard functionality on Dead Happy. Um, so first thing we, when we started off is we've got this area, a bit more detail about us specifically. Um, and then we can click onto the death wishes area and see sort of a series of tiles showing over different sort of um, these different wishes and uh, a nice ha handy indicator of the value and then the cost on, on the right hand side there. Back into this sort of dashboard area, nice little icon design there and then a bit more of specific detail about my cut. Um, so the plan and then, you know, the details, the payout and so on, all shown and when they were started and when they'll finish. So this is the, um, and then back into another one. This is the deal. This is what we've, I would imagine what the deal that we, we have provided. And then nice bit there, legal gump. Um, crystal ball showing information about um, the 10 year lifeline. What, what's the specific going on there in crystal ball? Um, well, so, so this is this is the account area. So when you are subscribed to our life insurance product, this is this is the thing that you you will see. Yep. Um, so we've broken down all the different elements uh, into, into little little tabs there. Yeah. Um, so the crystal ball um, is is effectively telling you what is going to happen in the future to your product and to your price. Yeah. Um, so we mentioned before that um, the approach we've taken with life insurance is very very different. Yeah. Um, and the product. Uh, has a very different construct to most life insurance products. Mm. So typically when you buy a life insurance product, you will buy something over 20 or 25 years. Yeah. Um, and the price will be fixed over those 20 or 25 years. Um, and you know, that is essentially so that if you have a, change, a significant change in health at any point along, along the way, you will still have valid cover in place so that you know, if, if you die, um, you, know, you will get your payout basically. Yeah. Um, the problem we see with that approach is that you know if you're say 30 or any age actually, um, but let's say 30, um, the chance of you dying this year is significantly lower than the chance of you dying in 20, 25, 30 years time. Um, that's just a fact for all of us. Sure. Um, so so when you average a price over a long period of time, basically you're you're taking into account that higher risk of dying and the therefore higher risk price, um, and averaging it with the lower risk price right now. Sure. Um, so we take a slightly different approach um, because we think effectively by doing that you, you will overpay for the first half um, and the theory being that you underpay for the second half. And that kind of works, the yeah. logic works, but only works if you last the distance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the average term of a life insurance policy is like 20 years or something, uh, maybe more, um, but people only tend to stick with it for five, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so they overpay for those five, six or seven years because you know, the insurer has to take into account the fact that they, they might die, or they're higher risk of dying in, in 20 or 25 years time, yeah. and they have to pay for that upfront. Okay. Um, so what we prefer to do is, is charge customers the actual price uh, related to their risk of dying this year. Yeah. Um, and, and that means it goes up every year. Okay. Um, so that crystal ball is basically some indication of what's gonna happen to your price uh, over time. Over time. Um, so it will go up a little bit every year, sure. um, but just to reflect the fact that you, you are more likely to die <laughs> next year than you are this year. Yeah, yeah, um, and we kind of cap that increase to give people certainty about, you know, it's not going to skyrocket overnight kind of thing. So, sure. um, yeah, it's a very different product construct. Mm. Um, we have a slightly different approach to the term as well. So normally when you buy life insurance, people ask you, how long do you want it for? That's a really difficult decision for, for people to ask. I don't know. And, and at that point, you might default to, to go and get some financial advice. Yeah. Um, uh, so we just say, right, we can, we'll guarantee to cover you for 10 years. 
Um, but then every year will give you the op opportunity to kind of extend that so that it's like effectively like a rolling 10 years worth of cover. Okay. So at any point, you've always got um, close to 10 years of cover ahead of you mm -hmm. if you do have a, a change in health sure. so that, you know, we'll guarantee to cover you um, for that period of time. So it's, it's, a, it's a different approach. Um, yeah. As I say, you know, uh, it's not for everybody. If you're massively, massively risk averse, <coughs> then you should probably go for the, for the long term approach. Yeah. But for, for the rest of us who just want some cover just in case something nasty happens, um, we think it's, it's a product construct that works quite well. Sure. How did you come up with the sort of the parameters for each of them? And, you know, are these things that you've been told you know, that, that have to be included in a policy? And is it just a novel way of exploring how to present those? What's the, what's um, the idea with those? Yeah, I mean, I guess we didn't think too much about it, I suppose. I mean, um, the FCA dictates um, what stuff uh, you have to provide to the customer. Uh -huh. You know, it, it's, it's all sensible and obvious stuff that you would want to know as a consumer uh, when, when you're buying a financial product, like, you know, what are the, what are the terms of the deal? Um, what happens uh, if, if one of the events you're insuring against happens? Um, how do you cancel? How much you're paying? When you're paying? All that kind of obvious stuff. Um, and I guess we just bucketed it up into things that we felt groups that kind of made sense to, to live together and just yeah. just created the dashboard that way. Just a, a more easily digestible form of a, of a terms and conditions document, basically. Yeah, but it doesn't feel like hiding it, does it, either, which is one of the things which I often get with insurance products is they often, you know, seem like they're being, you know, hit, hidden off in a corner somewhere, yep. whilst it's the sort of like centre, front and centre of the yep. dashboard area. Yeah. Really so easily accessible. Yeah, coming back to the tone of voice, I suppose, that that kind of um, human English approach to, to all of our communications translates to the, ter to the terms and conditions as well. Um, you know, I think as an industry, generally, we, we are very guilty of terms and conditions, terms and conditions being like an ass covering exercise. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, they are there for the customer to understand exactly what it is they're buying. Yeah. Um, and that's how we view it is, is you know, uh, we want the customer to be able to read these things. Um, and therefore, the language that we use in them is is, is normal language that they would use every day. Yeah. Um, we even throw a bit of humour into our terms and conditions. Why the hell not? Um, and we get people saying, you know, that that they actually enjoyed reading our documentation, which is just a bit weird, but um, it's kind of <laughs> cool, isn't it? Um, there are certain ways, I guess, of being able to highlight key bits of information you want users to focus on. For you guys, I guess it's you know the 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 legal language itself has to be there mm -hmm. in a certain re respect. So. I would imagine there's a link, for example, something to the, the legal terms or the legal document. And then you have a, a separate set of sort of terms? Nope. No, so um, what, you, what you're looking at there with the dashboard is uh, almost an exact replica of what's in the terms and conditions document, right. just segmented. Okay. Um, you know, as I said before, it's, it's ultimately a fairly simple product. Mm. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to have lots of terms and conditions attached to it. Um, so, so no, we don't. We don't have a separate document that is kind of hidden away that right, customers okay. have to click a tiny little link to see. I thought you would. Have that is that is what it is. So, so you know, you you, you reference the legal gump. There's yeah. some stuff that that we have to say, and there's a certain way that we have to say it, mm. um, and that's all housed in there. But that's a couple of lines, nothing major. Okay. Um, cool. Everything else in terms of what it is you're actually buying and the, and the terms of that are all contained in those other sections, exactly as they are, they are written, pretty much in in the terms and conditions document. Bravo, cool. Um, so next up, we're going to take a look at the death wishes part of the journey. So kicking off, um, we have a whole host there, and then name your death wish. I guess this is uh, the ability to create a custom or you know a unique one for our, for our specific uh, wishes. Mm -hmm. And then here we're going to go on a trip. We've got a free text field here, allowing I guess just that you know that personal touch, the ability to. You know, use your own language, use your own words. Um, is that something you're thinking about with that, or is it just simply just we need the detail of what's going to happen when this money's accessed? Uh, so, so yeah. So the Death Wish platform is is the the epicenter of our business, effectively. Mm. So, you know, as I said before, if if you view us just as a life insurance business, and, and we think we're we're going to be more than that, but sure. but for now we're, we're a life insurance business. Um, you know, what most people life, what l most life insurers ask you when you start is um, how much cover do you want, how long do you want it for, and what type of product do you want? Yeah. Um, and they're quite difficult decisions. Um, so the first question we start with is kind of really getting to the root of why somebody wants life insurance um, is 
what do you want to happen when you die? Mm -hmm. um, and, and our death wish, you know, that, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer in itself. Yeah. Um, but the death wish platform is our way of helping people to, to, to answer that question. Okay. Um, and, you know, these specific death wishes that you're kind of seeing there, yeah. are, are, you know, we've got a list of maybe 15 or so that people can, can pick from. Um, and they're the obvious things that people think about when, when buying life insurance, like pay off the mortgage, pay the debts, pay for my funeral, that kind of stuff. Um, so, so people have the opportunity to kind of uh, you know, decide on how much they, they want for those kind of things. Yeah. And they're fairly practical and obvious things. Um, but you know, we, we think life insurance can be so much more powerful than that. Um, and that's why we have some of the other examples in there like, you know, create a bronze statue of yourself or, or send one, someone off on a holiday or, or, or pay someone to take the bins out or whatever, you know. Yeah. Actually, um, we want people to think differently about, you know, that question, what do you want to happen when you die? And think about more of the emotional things because ultimately that, they are the things that, that matter most to people. Of course, the practical and the money side of it is, is really important to get sorted. But actually then what we find is when people do engage with this platform, they spend a lot of time thinking about what actually they want to put into those death wishes. And, and the stuff that people put in there is just incredible. Really? You know, from really funny stuff to, to really kind of uh, heart, you know, heart, um, you know, really like emotional, um, stuff that, that kind of really makes you, makes your eyes well up yeah. um, to, to you know just a whole just some downright weird stuff as well <laughs> um, and it's people's opportunity to express themselves and say look this is what I want to happen when I die we get a lot of people talking about how they don't want a traditional funeral and you know they want pe they don't want their money wasted on stuff like that uh, they want people to have a big party or whatever yeah. um, and and you know we have all sorts of stuff from I uh, yeah. had one the other day about someone wants to, if they die, they want to send their, their wife a, a rose every year. Um, so really? they want to put some money aside and, 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 and some facility to do that kind of stuff. Okay. And some really, really brilliant stuff in there. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the free form text enables people to, to really do that. Um, and, you know, it, it gives people an emotional connection with what they're buying. Mm -hmm. So you buy life insurance from a traditional provider, you end up with a piece of paper that says, I have a certain amount of cover and I pay this much for it and these are all the terms and conditions of it. Fine, um, but you file that away in a drawer somewhere and actually probably never look at it ever again and then when you die, you know, your family has to kind of root through all of your paperwork and find this magical document so that they can claim the money. Yeah. Um, so we would much rather people have you know, a relationship with this thing. Mm. Um, you know, maybe that's too strong a word, but actually some kind of affinity with it. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, with it. yeah, exactly. And, and so that it means something, it's a bit more tangible for them because it's no longer just this piece of paper with a cover amount on it. Yeah. Actually, when I die, I want these things to happen. Okay. Um, and ultimately we want people to share this. You know, th there is no mechanism for sharing a life insurance policy with with the people that you're buying it for, because buying a life insurance policy is an act of love at the end of the day, because you're never going to benefit from it. Yeah. Um, so you know, we want to make it really, really easy for people to share the fact that they have bought this thing for their loved ones and their friends, mm. um, and and also you know, uh, um, make it much easier for people to then act on it if and when they do die during the, the term of the policy. So sure. so that's what this is all about, really. And and you know, yeah. so far. Lots and lots of people are engaging with it and, and engaging with it really, really well. Um, and you know, if you talk about what Dead Happy might become in the future, um, the death wishes are the epicenter of all of that stuff. Okay. Um, so, you know, by just putting down a number of wishes that you want to happen when you die, you've got the basis for a will. Um, so we'd like to, to to tackle wills at some point. Um, okay. And, and you know, do the same thing with the Wills product as, as we've tried to do with the life insurance product, which is you know, really go into the heart of what is wrong with the product today, uh, or our perception of what is wrong with the product today, mm -hmm. um, and try and solve some of those, those, those problems and make it much more accessible for people. Um, sure. The problem with Wills is that they, particularly simple Wills, they often get contested. Mm. Um, so you know, if people write something down that they want to happen, you don't want your friends and family kind of fighting over that uh, at some point in the future when you die because of just that's just how the legal process works. Yeah. You know, we'd like to create something that, that, that holds up in law much better and is okay. you know, accessible and easy, easy, easy to, to get in the same way that we hope our life insurance product is. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, from uh, people leaving kind of specific memories for people, um, you know, uh, the process of dying 
uh, a digital death these days is pretty difficult because you have a myriad of different digital accounts that your family kind of have to find all the passwords for and either shut down or, or whatever it is. So we want to make that process much easier. Just anything related to death, we want to make the process of dying just a lot easier and, and you know, the process of planning for that yeah. just much more interesting and engaging. So there's all sorts of stuff we will yeah. do, but it will center around these, these death wishes death and all its constituent parts. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so um, you were talking about those scenarios you come up with around 15 or so pre-filled ones. Mm -hmm. I, I would, the brainstorming session for that must have been fun at the very least. Uh, uh, you're probably giving it too much credit to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just throw them all together. <laughs> just. Um, I mean, there's just some obvious stuff, yeah. like, you know, like the mortgage hey, and the, the debts and the funeral yeah. and that kind of stuff that have to be in there. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess we just, well, I suppose we did throw a few I ideas together in terms of what are the things that we want to put in there to give people inspiration for, for, for this softer side of stuff. Yeah. You know, because I think people need a little nudge towards it. Um, once they've had that nudge, you know, they create some amazing stuff, but they just need permission, I suppose, to, to start thinking about these things. Yeah. Um, you know, the more emotional side of things. So, mm -hmm. so you know, we just, we just kind of came up with a few ideas for, for, for what they might be. Um, and you know, one of the big things that we're working on at the moment is is developing that Deathwish platform. So we kind of envisage it like a retail experience in the okay. future. Okay. Um, so you know, it's just it's basically a glorified cover calculator at the moment, yeah. um, and it works really well. Um, but we want it to become so much more. So we want you know people to get inspiration from each other with their death wishes. Yeah, As I yeah. said, we want people to be sharing their death wishes. Um, you know, maybe we'll we'll have like sponsored death wishes. You know, from from providers, um, yeah. so you can get specific costs of a specific thing. So it might be a funeral or, or whatever, or a holiday or an experience or something. You know, there's all sorts of stuff we want to do, just to purely to give people inspiration for for how they answer that difficult question of what do you want to happen when you die. Yeah, and I guess like you said before, to encourage them to actually tackle that question. Yeah. Um, so the uh, the visibility around sort of the outgoings, as it were. Um, at the end of each of the death wish bits, um, there is a sort of a, a cue of, you know, what's going out, money-wise and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Do you find that that's important, that matters, you know, in terms of the, the, the lump sum at the end of what, what's going out? I think, so, yeah, I mean, I guess if you look at it purely through a life insurance lens, yeah. um, the death wishes are there in order t for you to get to a number uh -huh. of life insurance cover that you want. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, then summarizing that up at the end of it and saying, okay, if you want all of these things to happen, you uh, want, uh, I, I hesitate, I don't want to say the word need because I don't think anybody needs life insurance. It should be a want. Um, you want 100 grand's worth of cover or, okay. or 200 grand's worth of cover or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, playing that back to the customer is, is, is important because once you've done your death wishes, you then get into the business end mm -hmm. of actually then applying for the insurance. Um, uh, which we hope is the bit that people spend the least amount of time on and, and you know, because that's just the transactional part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but ultimately they need to know what they're kind of getting themselves in for, I suppose. Sure, sure. And, uh, and that the majority of that work all happens via these death wishes and, and, yep. and the surrounding is, um, visuals that go with that. Yep. So f the final part of what we're going to look at is this uh, subscriptions area. So they have, um, we've got, we've been given the nod, as you can see, and then we can start off with our payment. So as I said, we, um, you know, you're usually looking to get the user through this quite quickly mm -hmm. um, with as little friction as possible. We've got details in these tiles of sort of the, the core constituent parts of that, of that uh, subscription. So the future, and then we've got this nice little uh, intercom pop-up star thing. Um, and then details of the lifeline, the 10 year lifeline. Um, and then I guess that's specific to sort of like when you develop an illness. Yep. Uh, and then some of the things which are not, you know, uh, not playing ball in this particular instance um, is shown there. And then a list of dangerous things here. So I guess these are things that the user can typically avoid doing in order to um, um, to be, you know, less at risk, I would imagine. Uh, well, there are exclusions, basically. So, so every life insurance policy will come with some exclusions. So if you are doing some ridiculously dangerous stuff, <laughs> like base jumping, for example, yeah. um, you're not, you're not going to get paid a you're life insurance one. payout. So we just need to make that really clear to customers what they will get a payout for and what yeah. they won't. Uh, and it's a very few things that will affect very few people. But mm -hmm. you know, we have to, we have to make it there. clear. Sure. Um, 
and, and you know, as, as you've seen, we do that in our in our own style and our own language. Absolutely, uh, as we do throughout. Yeah, very cool. Um, so that's the um, you've used the type form as I mentioned. We didn't see it on that specific um, on that speci specific video, but we've seen just before that there's a, a, t a process of gathering information by a type form. Yeah. Um, so is that using I guess using their APIs or would you so. Uh, have you gone? Would you find? You, would you describe yourself as going for that sort of no-code approach a lot of the time? You know, any solution we can sort of get together. Um, well, it's a mixture. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, you, di you didn't see what it looks like, but we have essentially four medical questions that yep. a customer has to answer. Mm -hmm. Every single customer has to answer those four medical questions. It takes about a minute. It's not not particularly onerous, yep. but every single person has to answer those questions. So we built those in our own platform. It mm -hmm. just makes sense to do that. Um, and then I talked about before how, depending on your answers to those questions, there may be a few additional questions. Yeah. Um, those are the ones that we serve through Typeform mm -hmm. because there's a myriad of different permutations that you, that you can go through. Um, so, so we we service those up through Typeform just because it's instead of you know building all of those different paths in our, our platform, yeah. uh, we just build them all in Typeform. Then you know a wider pool of people can can manage it. Um, and, and we don't have to have a code release every time we want to change something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just it just makes things simple. So it's kind of that mixed approach, you know, mm -hmm. using using our own code where it's going to add value, yeah. but then where we don't think it is actually, or when it's going to speed stuff up, we'll, we'll pick something off the shelf and, and use it that way. Um, okay. And and we think you know that makes the user experience um, slick and yeah. easy. Um, and it makes our job in terms of building it and maintaining it a lot, lot easier as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it's a it's a mixture, and it and it seems to work pretty well so far. Yeah. Um, so when you do see that, you'll see sort of the type form. Their design language is maintained to a certain extent, but mm -hmm. you've also got your own sort of like colorings going over the top of it and that sort of thing. So it seems like a nice ability to combine both the, I guess, their software development kits or whatever. Service it might be called with your own sort of personal yeah. information and branding and that. Yeah, sort of I mean, thing. and it's probably more we can do there because they're not identical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's sort of okay in a way because yeah. I think people are familiar with the de with the type form design language and to a certain extent that works for them. Then yep. th there's a familiarity, there's an ease of use that comes with that. Um, yep. But then there's also those like tiny, like small visual cues to say, hey, you're still within dead happy here. Yep. And, you know, that's a that's a really smart sort of. I think that's a really smart approach to it. Um, personally, and then you've also got that sort of um, that sort of intercom support thing at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, is that using intercom itself, or have you got your own provider? You know, and yeah. you're able to just overlay your own logo on top of the intercom sort exactly. of widget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, that's cool. So that's a really that seems like you've uh, made use of. We talk about this quite a lot in terms of like leveraging the services that are out there, which already do a good job of these things, mm -hmm. and w not worrying about that so much. I think, um, and this is a perfect examples of those. You know, use your type form for data gathering exercises, and then use your chat support from Intercom and so on and so forth. And then focus on the thing that you do well, which in your case, you know, is things like the tone of voice and actually getting that information ready for the decisioning, and and also preventing presenting that sort of nice approach to you know the payments and that sort of thing. Um, so these all seem like a really neat neat uh, policy. So uh, in terms of the actual. Um, information that you're asking for and you're presenting when it comes to payment time. Uh, again, that's a process of something which you have to get the right information ready, any FCA requirements, that sort of thing. Uh, at payment stage, you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess you're, you've got to present that information in terms of you know the risks and what. Yeah, so, so we have to viable. We effectively have to have to present the deal to the customer, yeah. all the terms and conditions of that deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's similar approach to the dashboard. You know, we kind of put it into cards so yeah, that yeah. it's a bit more easy to digest mm -hmm. uh, and segmented. Um, and yeah, and then the the customer just just transacts um, effectively through a through a Stripe widget. So oh, it's, a it's, widget. it's it's fairly straightforward. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully presented in a way that's easy for customers to digest, and so they know exactly what it is they're they're signing up to. Yeah, absolutely, um, perfect. So uh, just before we close off, um, I wondered if we could find out anything. You know, what are you excited for for 2020? You've talked a bit about you know the 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 way that you'd like to use Death Wishes going forward, and but um, any any big plans for 2020? Yeah, <laughs> loads. Um, so yeah, it's really it's a really exciting time for us because you know growth of the team, yeah. um, growth of what we what we can do, what our capability is, mm -hmm. uh, and all sorts of stuff. You know, the Deathwish platform is number one. That's that is the most exciting thing I think about about the business and yeah. and really developing that and and you know kind of 
helping people to, to have those thoughts uh, about death and you know do it in an engaging way that, that's not you know uh, morbid or, 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 or any of that kind of stuff you know it's just it's just accessible for people sure. uh, and providing more services and products off the back of that yeah. um, from a product perspective I guess a um, couple of big things that are due to go live in the next few months um, so we talked about this kind of refresh process how you refresh your your 10-year lifeline every year yeah um, you know we've, we've we've kind of got some big releases to improve that process which are going live uh, over the next couple of months so that's really exciting because that's kind of proving that our construct of product works yeah um, so that'd be really cool to see that um, we've got uh, a lot a lot of our customers ask about critical illness um, okay. which is a, another insurance product not specifically related to death it's more to do with if you get diagnosed with a really nasty illness, basically you get some cash to, to kind of tide you over. Right. Um, so you know we, we're trying to take the same approach That's to that product as we have to the life insurance product, um, and and you know basically think about what is the fundamental need we're trying to address with this product, yeah. and how can we uh, build a product which is is different uh, and actually addresses those needs um, and, and does a lay away with a lot of the the perhaps superfluous stuff that maybe a lot of people don't necessarily need. Sure. Um, so we're working through that at the moment, so that's gonna be quite cool to see see that to come to fruition and yeah, a whole load of other stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the brand side as well. Um, you know, as, as you can imagine with a with a brand like ours, you can have um, quite a lot of fun with it. Yeah, um, And sure. there's some, some really uh, interesting um, plans coming coming down the line as well. So it'd be really good to see, see that some of those come into fruition as yeah. well. Sounds great. And all done out of Leicester, of course, as you mentioned before, the show kicked off. Absolutely. Um, one of the one of the great fintechs out there uh, on uh, making use of the geography of the UK, if you will. Yes, the, yeah. epi the epicenter of the of the fintech world, Leicester. <laughs> um, oh, it's yeah, just no. nice to know that, you know, there are fintech companies out there operating outside of London. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not a city person myself, so it's sort of nice to know that there are, you know, that there, there are the places where, you know, you can you can go and work elsewhere. Well, Leicester isn't, isn't a rural location, I, I just have to tell you. Um, but no, from us, the, the, but it's, it's a lot closer to rural location. It, indeed, yes. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, for our perspective, it's, uh, it makes things like recruiting a hell of a lot easier. Yeah. Um, because you know, there aren't many businesses that, that exist that are trying to do something like we are doing in the way that we are doing it. Mm. Um, you know, like, like any kind of startup business, we think a lot about culture and you know, trying to create an environment that really gets the best out of you know, limited resources and limited people. Um, so you know, um, we've created a culture of you know, kind of no rules and, and, and all sorts of that good, like you know, no hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, and you know, people hear about this stuff and it's quite novel and unique in that area. Um, so it just makes our job a lot, lot easier in terms of attracting really great people. Yeah. Uh, sure. Whereas there's probably, you know, hundreds of businesses that will tell you the same thing down here. Um, it's just a, it's just a little bit of a different world up there, um, yeah. which, you know, uh, it means we don't have to spend our life recruiting basically, which is, sure. is cool. And also, I guess, you know, quite close to proximity to a whole host of really good universities must be quite helpful as well. Yep, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we started off our life on a university campus. Oh, cool. um, so, so yeah, there's, there's loads of, there's loads of great talent that we can, we can tap into tap with straight connections into. like that, which is, is good. Perfect. But a, we've had one message in from 11FS Group CEO saying he loves that t-shirt that you're uh -huh, wearing. Ah, yes. So, uh, thanks for that, David. Um, <laughs> That's, I'm going to wrap that one up then for today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, so stop by next week for more insights and journeys. Uh, if you want to see more of the 11FS Pulse product, head over to pulse.11fs.com where you can request a demo. If you've got any questions about the product or want to suggest a journey for us to sort of take a look at on our platform or on the show, hit us up at pulse at 11fs.com or find us on Twitter at 11fs Pulse. Dominic, if people want to find out a bit more about Dead Happy or about you in particular, where should they go? Uh, I can't imagine anyone want to find more about me, but if you want to find more <laughs> about Dead yeah. Happy, um, just go to the website, deadhappy.com, and, and, and take a little look around. And take a look around. Got any questions? Use the live chat, and we'll be more than happy to give you a bit more information. Great. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, see you next weekend. Bye-bye.